Hello. Hello, everyone. Yay. Our happy time Aloha. of the week. <laughs> Hope you're all okay. We're really looking forward to being with you. Sitting together. Remember to take the time to look at everybody, the happy mudita time. <laughs> taking refuge in Sangha. Mm. That feels great. Let's take a quick look through here. Japan, Susan Canada, <laughs> North America. <laughs> it's fun every week. There's always a couple of new folks too, yeah. or new to the Sunday sitting. Always sweet. Wow. Oh, and Richard. Please away. Great. <laughs> Mary. Wow. This is so great. All right, well, might as well get started here. I thought um, in the spirit of the season, we do a little different flavor of meditation practice to begin with. So I'll just start with a short reading from the Vasudhi Maga. <clears throat> A yogi devoted to mindfulness of death is constantly diligent. They acquire perception of disenchantment with all kinds of becoming. They conquer attachment to life. They condemn evil. They avoid storing. They have no stain of avarice about requisites. Perception of impermanence grows in them, following upon their appear the insights into dukkha and non-self. And while beings who have not developed mindfulness of death fall victim to fear, horror, and confusion at the time of death, as though suddenly seized by wild beasts, spirits, snakes, robbers, or murderers, this yogi dies undiluted and fearless without falling into any such state. And if they do not attain the deathless there and now, they are at least headed for a happy destiny upon the breakup of the body. When a person is truly wise, their constant task will surely be this recollection about death, blessed with such mighty, mighty potency. So in the spirit of Halloween, the days of the dead coming up and just the spirit that I think is evoked this time of year so powerfully. I'll sit together in a gentle invitation for this quality of insight and reality. So just as always, finding our relatively comfortable seated posture. Understanding that conditions are bound to change, that any posture will become susceptible to unpleasant sensations over time. We still try to 
get settled into a physical condition that will allow for the quieting of the mind, some stability, some settledness, with also some quality of alertness, awakeness, attentiveness. As you begin to let the eyes close, just as always, noticing where the attention naturally falls, naturally comes into contact with whatever experience is most predominant right now. Whether sound, body sensation, thoughts, emotions. Seeing, smelling, tasting. Simply starting to receive these arisings and passings on their own terms. Careful about our agenda, our preferences. And seeing to what degree we can receive whatever phenomena that we notice with this evenness of attention. This equality of worthiness of no matter what arises in the field of awareness, worthiness of our care, our interests, our exploration. And while we know that really our practice does not require much more than this, simply this open awareness to these streams of experience that we call our life, ourselves, We also know that narrowing for a time, the field of attention can be a skillful way to be able to keep up with this flow as it's moving so quickly, so unrelentingly. So, drawing the attention more closely just into the realm of sound. Or the physical experiences throughout the body. And the rising and falling of the abdomen. that follows the motions of breathing. As they happen naturally.
And our general training is so much to take care, to try to observe the birth, life, and death of each experience. The arising and passing of a moment of hearing. The arising and passing of physical sensation. in a minute way or in the broader gestures of a whole rising and falling of the breath. We recognize that these truths are true at many levels. A physical sensation that feels very solid permanent when we watch closely we can see that it's also made up of smaller moments arising and passing the sense of who we are our minds the thought stream also broken up into small moments of consciousness, thought, awareness, emotion. We watch the full rising of the breath, and the full falling, the rising of a sound passing away of a sound, the birth of a thought, the death of a thought. The very purpose of this orientation is toward the understanding of recognition, not just in ideas, but in the direct experience that all that arises will pass away. All that comes into being because of conditions will dissipate when those conditions change. All that is born will die. And in this practice, we come to recognize and honor that truth at the smallest scales of existence. In the broader waves of our lives. And it is possible to attune the attention further simply to the passing away of phenomena. So that we see the ending of the breath. Yes, there is the rising, but we see the end of the rising. There is the falling, and we attune to the end of the falling. 
sound arises, pay closer attention to its dissipation. A thought arises, we pay closer attention to its disappearance. Seeing for a few moments to what degree we can orient that way, inclining the attention toward the disappearance, the ending, the passing away of all the phenomena that we encounter. can see that it sometimes takes a little different kind of energy. Sometimes it might bring a little more energy to our practice. We can get a little lazy as phenomena arise and pass on their own. This leaning into just the passing be quite powerful, sometimes evocative. Sometimes we see the resistance in the heart and mind, the clinging to stability, just trusting that we can balance the attention with care, and tenderness for the heart that is scared by the ending of things, that wants things to last, seeks for stability in the control. Nothing wrong with caring about any fear or wanting that arises. And of course, this also can be brought into the fold of our insight, the fear itself dissipating, the longing itself coming to an end. All phenomena disappearing on their own accord due to natural condition.
as we practice in this way. Certain truths become clarified, refined, that all phenomena are subject to decline, to pass away, to disappear. and a stability and quietude of mind that develops in the acceptance of this inevitability. It can be helpful to reflect upon that all that is subject to birth is subject to decay and death. There is no part of ourselves in thought and emotion and awareness and physicality and any of our sense experiences that is beyond this truth. Letting that penetrate our hearts, our minds, our bodies. As much as we care and appreciate all of these shining, brilliant stars of experience, that they are momentary and fleeting. Not as a negation of our love, just as a purification and balancing. And that, in fact, everyone we know is subject to the same truths. Anyone we can imagine in any state, in any condition, any form of life. Subject to change, to death. So as one of our great teachers instructed us, this reflection can be a practice in itself. As we breathe in, we can reflect upon that truth that everyone we know will die. And on the exhalation, to recollect that I too will die. Inhale, everyone I know will die. And exhale, and I too will die. And while there may be experiences of resistance, of tension, of fear that are evoked, to remember that the deepest aspiration is the reminder of this to bring peace to the mind, to the heart, to this part of reality we so deeply avoid and evade, deny.
and we relax and release into the truth of it as a gift of wisdom to ourselves and the world around us. Breathing in, everyone I know will die. And seeing if there's any release in the heart. And I too will die. And feeling any relief when we stop fighting. the truth of all existence. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. Hmm. Or I wasn't sure if that would be better this weekend or next, but I decided it was better than the contemplation of the bloated corpse meditation, which you can also find in the Vasudhi Maga, <laughs> if you're interested for Halloween time. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. And let's see, Steve, are you there? There we go.
All right, Steve, I think you're all set there. Okay. In wisdom, that was the monastic Sari, Sariputta. And he encouraged us to have a, an honest self-assessment. To be able to look at both our shadow side and our bright side. He used the example of a tarnished bronze bowl that when left alone, it was caked with a dark, sticky grime uh, and taking up a cloth, uh, a white cloth, and, and rubbing the side of the bowl, the tarnish would begin to come off and it would stain the cloth, but the bowl began to express its luminous nature, began to become uh, luminous, shiny, bright from within. Just the way the stars now seem so much brighter at night here in Hawaii, darkness coming earlier uh, in the evening. Uh, and if the moon is out and the moon and the stars both illuminate every, everything around in the night sky. Um, but even without the moon, the stars can be so bright, you can find your way, you can walk uh, around it by the light of the stars. And in the same way, uh, we, have, we have practiced lineages, both in the Vipassana tradition and in the Brahma Vihara tradition, where we can take that honest self-assessment and, and look at ourselves. There's many comparisons in Vipassana. One of them is to um, look at the hindrances and the awakening factors, which are always paired together. When one is listed, the other one is listed. One is the is that film of tarnish that that blocks the other, and as we rub away the the hindrances of attachment to sense desire, uh, anger and ill will, uh, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and the fifth being um, doubt or chronic indecisiveness. As we look at them, the very mindful observation, investigation, and, and the aim of understanding, not the aim of getting rid of, but the aim of understanding and feeling, sensing each one in the body is, is like the cloth rubbing off the tarnish uh, and the luminous nature of our heart begins to, to shine out. In, in the form with Vipassana in the form of the necklace of jewels that we call the Ganga, our awakening factors, the mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, our courage, our gene energizing, and then calm, concentration, equanimity, being um, more on the tranquil, calming side of balance mental faculties. So one really leads to the other. If, if we have that honest self-assessment, we investigate, then we look at each of hindrances, whichever, whatever ones are up for us in the moment that they're up. Um, using wise reflection, if it's useful, but if we're actually meditating, it's more the direct, connected, uh, visceral, observing awareness 
that that feels in clenching of attachment to sense desire that knows the heat and contraction of the mind uh, being crushed by anger or ill will and that knows that that drifty dreamy haze fog-like um, sloth or torpor where we're actually falling asleep often not because we're tired but uh, as a as a defense uh, to seen clearly and once we've respected and investigated uh, the reality of that hindrance as a defense, we can sidestep and actually feel what the experience is behind it, underneath it, what current of phenomena is actually there uh, that we might not be able to see at the time. And the same is true with uh, anxiety or restlessness, the, the mind that's jumping around, unable to stabilize opposite of, of uh, calm and concentration. And the doubting mind that can paralyze our practice and yet can be overcome by directly looking at the doubting mind, that, that indecisiveness, the clarity that comes from understanding doubt is the, is the remedy is the wisdom that is the opposite of doubt, that the confidence and clarity, that's the opposite of chronic indecisiveness. So we take, we take these opposites, we take the dark and we take the light and, and we look at both of them and one can lead to the other. The same is true in our practices of the Brahma Viharas or the immeasurables, the sublime, dwellings, abiding in unconditional love, abiding in the connected care of compassion, celebrating that appreciative joy wherever we see beauty, fullness, wholeness, happiness, um, and the, the calm, peaceful stability of equanimity, which is there all the time with part of, along with and developing uh, the other three Brahma Viharas. Uh, so they come hand in hand, they're, they're shadowed on either side, one with a near enemy and the other a far enemy. So if we really want to develop the purest kind of Brahma Vihara heart, the, the luminosity, we really want to um, rub off the tarnish uh, to allow the heart to show its innate nature um, and the unconditional forms of love, care, joy, and, and uh, equipoise of heart, then we must look at um, what can shadow each of the Brahma Viharas and be mistaken for them. So for metta, it's some form of, of an attachment of a self-centered love with a hook or affection. We need to understand it because we all have it and they, they, they travel side by side with true metta. So it's not, it's not our aim to rid ourselves of all of our relationships that have any degree of attachment. Um, our conditionality. It's our aim to understand them. And then alongside, see that the, the Brahma Vihara heart can also develop the, our, our, the attached forms of our, of our, our likes, friendships, love and affections um, by having the accompanying pure metta deepen and unfold and then next then we can't be we can't be fooled by the masquerade of metta by a substitute and the far enemy uh, which sometimes is generated 
uh, either by habit or by a focused intention. The opposite of metta is ill will. Uh, anything from irritability to dislike to aversion, anger, and violent forms of thought or speech or action. We certainly want to understand that and with those opposites as well, those far enemies, we don't have to get rid of them in a permanent way in order to have the heart of unconditional love, love that doesn't refer back to an I, me, or mine, a, genu a genuinely selfless, completely generous love. We, we only need to bring our understanding to bear, to, to know the pain of ill will, the darkness of the anger, that under it, it's hard to function in any way, in a, any healthy, normal way, physically, emotionally, mentally. We can, we can actually take our metta or one of the Brahma Vihara companions, the care of compassion, um, and bring it as that rubbing cloth when there is ill will in the mind, when there is anger, when there is a disruptive, um, when there's a rupture in the mind that's disruptive of the normal stream, or the native stream of the mind of loving kindness. We care for that pain. We, we care for the, the oppression of that darkness, of anger, of hatred, of ill will. We investigate it. How does it feel in the mind? How does it affect or influence other mental states? How does it affect consciousness itself? It can be a direct investigation of, of, of dhammas if we're actually in practice or we can use wise reflective by asking those questions I just asked. Just ask, what happens if I succumb, if I allow, if I invite in that ill will or in that pool of anger, in it, either with mindfulness or caring for it with compassion, caring for the pain of that with a degree of understanding that it's it's impersonal, it's a causal quality. It's not my fault. Conditions occur. Usually we've been hurt ourselves for us to feel that anger or that ill will or that instinct to attack back if we're triggered by something or someone. So we, we look as Sariputta advised with an honest self-assessment, is this a genuine moment of unconditional love. This is all we're going for here, just like in the Vipassana, we're just going for a moment of mindfulness or a few moments of genuine mindfulness that are purely reflective of what's happening, not what we want to happen, not with identification. If there's identification or attachment, it's not mindfulness. It's a thought formation uh, infused with, with eye making thoughts. So we use a, a moment of mindfulness we bring a, a Brahma Hara to bear. to stuff is itself on you mean it's a selfless compassion it's compassion karuna mudita it's because it has a wisdom element it's the subtlest of all the brahma viharas and it brings the wisdom to bear to understand yeah that's the opposite of metta that's ill will that's that's uh, rooted in the unhealthy psychological root of hatred that just is, 
That's, that's the way it is. It's a choose of things, as Jesse was talking about in our meditation. Um, and at the same time, we can care for that pain. And there's wisdom there to help us care for that, to help us explore that, that far enemy as well as the near enemy. In compassion, the compassion practice, we can be fooled by some form of conditioned karuna, conditioned compassion. Uh, some level of attachment is there. The near enemy is usually called pity, uh, which can distance ourselves from the experience. Real compassion is fearless in the face of dukkha or suffering. Uh, whereas um, usually our understanding of pity has some de degree or more of a self-centeredness that feels separate from the suffering of the suffering person. Saying grief and sorrow are also mentioned as, as, as near enemies. Grief and sorrow are important emotions in their own right. And of course, we need to make a shelter for grief at times of loss and mourning. We also want to understand the difference that, that grief can look like compassion and sorrow can look like compassion and can be mistaken for it. So we, we want to know grief is grief and sorrow is sorrow. And that's that self-centered pity as, as that, a self-centered pity. Whereas true compassion is that dignified quality of pure fearless caring that feels good of some emotion there's joy in the act or the quality, heart quality of compassion. Uh, and this yogi actually was feeling sadness with compassion. Of course, we can have both of those experiences. <laughs> and, and then the next moment are seemingly side by side. Of course, there can be a sadness or there can be an identification with what we feel uh, compassion toward. And the compassion may be pure and unconditional and selfless, but a moment of identification or of self-referencing. And then, of course, there would be sadness. That should be also noticed. And then noticed when the pure, unconditional, care of compassion is present and how yes it's a pleasant feeling tone and it's a powerful pleasant feeling tone it's accompanying one of the most powerful emotions uh, in our lives compassion our, our caring caring for ourselves or others other beings when there is pain hurt stress anxiety sorrow suffering of any kind, dukkha of any kind. Uh, and in, those, in that moment, it's a good feeling to have that care. And we can feel joy because of that, that dukkha feeling tone, that sukha, our entire practice is our from one stepping stone to the next of deepening cons of dhamma pleasure or dhamma pleasures or things going the way we wish or want but just the truth of things as they are seeing the truth itself is a sudden release from attachment and conditioning thoughts uh, and ideas about things being the way they are. So an insight is a release, which is a pleasant feeling tone. 
And there's always joy with every insight. There's joy. So if, even insight into deep dukkha are often the quality of both compassion and joy together. As I've mentioned often, the, all four Brahma Viharas arise together. If we practice one, we're practicing all the others. If we're focusing primarily on one, if we just give a sideline a sideline glance, the other ones are really close at hand. So we might have compassion in the front and center, but right next very close anonymity and very close also on the other side might be the joy of feeling that pleasant feeling tone of caring. And close as well is metta, the sense of connection to, to being and the welfare of all living beings, starting with ourselves. And if we investigate the mudita quality, it, it has its shadow companions as well. The near enemy looking often looking looking like empathetic joy, but they're all um, Steve, I'm just gonna interrupt for a second. Actually I think now you seem totally frozen. Um I was going to just try to turn off his video, but now I can't even get to him. Try that. Hmm. Well, it looks like he dropped off. <clears throat> um, I think I assume he'll he'll sign back in in a moment, um, but I noticed some folks have noticed that. Basically, he's he's staying at a place where the internet is obviously not a very good connection, <laughs> and it's trying to get. Um, uh, he'll be moving to a new place at the end of the week, so he'll he should have better internet. Um, Let's just wait a minute and just see if he signs back on before we ourselves might make a different uh, go to question. So we can just sit quietly for a few minutes and see if he logs back on.
So he's trying to come back on. And if it doesn't happen in the next couple of minutes, we'll just go to some question and answers. Well, <clears throat> um, it's, it seems like he might. Oh, Michelle, did you want to? We could just say a few more things to end this talk and then take some questions. So yeah, um, I think that <laughs> if I was following along, um, Steve left off with the uh, shadow side of Mudita. Uh, which is um, really important. Uh, so you can see that a kind of basic way to describe that would be any kind of attached, an attached joy. Um, and we, we see how, um, for most of us, I think how quickly that will happen where we're, we're really um, something becomes pleasurable. And then um, because we're not aware how quickly that can turn into an attachment, um, we start missing that we can be mindful of enjoying, like enjoying, enjoying, just like Steve is saying, like we can be mindful of sadness or mindful of grief and make a shelter for that, actually make a shelter of that. And the, the, the Brahma Viharas are so interesting in that the equanimity um, when it comes back in or we we attempt to bring it back in, it balances the shadow. It's so it's so interesting how we can go for a long time when something's pleasurable and miss that we're getting more and more we're getting more and more attached to that experience and we're actually not receiving it, we're missing it. We're we're caught in the future again, wanting it to last, like wanting it to happen tomorrow or wanting it to happen, you know, the two weeks from now. And um so where that starts becoming um, the shadow in terms of the Brahma Vihara is, is that say you have a good friend that something wonderful happens for, and you start, you feel that warmth of heart and mudita, that empathetic joy, that real empathy of happiness for your friend, but then, then you might start wanting that yourself, right? It's, it's, if you look at it, all of this mindfully, it's the same process. It's like you can feel that happiness for the um, enjoyment of, the, of your friend or anybody, but you'll see how it, it'll, just like with anything, <laughs> it can be just a, a beautiful walk or a beautiful sunset. You want it to happen again, just with your friend, that's having a wonderful, um, pleasant, uh, or meaningful or successful experience, you'll feel that it starts to shift to uh, 
jealousy. And it's so, it's so painful. It's actually painful to watch that process of where we, we want the goodness. We want their goodness. <laughs> we want that for ourselves. Um, and this is just like when we're connecting to pain and it shifts to pity or sadness or grief or cruelty. This is the same with mudita. I just wanted to, to bring that in in case we can't, we can't get Steve back. I don't know if we will, but um, he was on a roll. Uh, I was kind of, there's Steve. I just saw him. Where is he? Is he back? Jesse? Can you get him? I saw him on page three. Huh. Yep, there he is. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I live in this valley and the, the signal bounces from someplace at the head of the valley. But it hits the valley walls or it hits some computer, it seems. But I'm migrating out of this valley in a few days. Steve, I still think you should turn off your video. So I'll be on it's... top of the hill. Yeah. Steve, I think you still need to oh. turn off your video. It's still freezing pretty badly. So there's a there's oh, okay. a way where there we go. Great. And that so um now if we'll just listen to you. Uh Michelle just spoke a bit okay. about Mudit Mudita and the shadow Mudita, but um I don't know if you, Michelle you want to say anything more, but otherwise you can No, I just I it. tried to fill in where I thought you were going, but it was just a guess. <laughs> yep. No, you're probably right on. You, you probably were more accurate than me. Did you do the far enemy? I talked about um, how just on a basic mindful moment to moment level, when we're when we have pleasurable feelings that it can shift so quickly into um, attachment and how like quickly yeah. when it when it shifts when we're doing mudita that same process happens where we can feel like, be feeling empathetic joy for someone and then it, it can just shift to wanting that for ourselves that's 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 the shadow and that it can become jealousy that's as far as i got okay yeah. and jealousy is something that we also want to understand that's part of the tarnish that we want to um, rub the bronze bowl to bring that tarnish out and in the process understand what the dirt is that uh, envy jealousy and discontent uh, are the opposite of empathetic joy and, and they block uh, the luminous nature of empathetic joy and their envy and jealousy are often rooted and conditioning around unworthiness and shame. So the practice of mudita uh, restores our, our sense of worthiness and being anchored in esteem uh, away from shame. And um, it builds up a healthy sense of ourselves, uh, uh, the selfless beauty of ourselves. And then finally, the upeka, to mistake indifference, is really common for, uh, for us humans. Uh, we think being indifferent or numbing out can be equanimity at times. And it works great as a defense, but it's not real equanimity. It's not connected to what we're experiencing with ourselves and other people. And the opposite to equanimity is the reactivity. So we, we want to know that battle part. We want to know that darkness with equal um, interest and exploration, wise exploration. The reactivity that uh, goes for attachment to pleasant and aversion to unpleasant. If we understand these opposites, then that's like the cloth rubbing off the tarnish and the bronze bowl showing its luminous, uh, shining nature, the heart of the Brahma, Vihara, truly abiding 
in boundless, unconditional love, in boundless, fearless, unconditional care or compassion, and a boundless joy wherever we connect with beauty and, and art and happiness, goodness, fulfillment. And uh, in, the, in the depth of, of deeply centering, stabilizing equanimity, the upeka that is being asked of us. If we want to help in the situation that we're faced with, the many situations that we're faced with in this, these, this unheard of days that we're living through this year, we want to establish these qualities in ourselves and be able to carry the attitude and a, a deep connection that we get from the Brahma Viharas and from our mindfulness practice to everyone we, re we can relate to. The person at the checkout counter in, in the store, the neighbor we haven't spoken to for years, near friends, far friends, anyone and everyone want that stability and, and want to feel, even if they don't know what's happening, our, our attitude of caring for their pain and our own. If we truly care for ourselves, then we can truly be caring of and influence the well-being of others. So now you may have questions for the visible, my visible colleagues. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll stay here, I'll listen. Yeah, we're here, and I think, because you, if Steve, you can also see everybody else, right? Even if they can't see you, so we'll, I we'll can see. see. Yeah. Um, great, great. Yeah, does anyone have any questions uh, this afternoon about um, your practice, about Steve's talk, uh, the instructions, anything that we might be able to support you with this week? You can uh, raise your little blue Zoom hand instead of your physical hand so we can see you up here on the list that you want to ask a question. See Cynthia. Oops. Hold on. Let me. Um, you disappeared from my screen there. Cynthia, can you? There we are. Can you unmute yourself now? There yeah. we go. Hi. Um. Oh. Maybe turn down your audio. Your I think the problem. I mean, it's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Did you turn it off? Yeah. Okay, this ah, should work. There we go. Um, so I was just wanting to ask Steve about, or anybody about the, um, I didn't quite get the thing about Mudita, um, I think I heard sort of healing shame or shame being the um, near or far enemy or whatever. So I just was curious about that. Mm -hmm. More about shame and the relationship to Mudita. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, you want to jump back into that? Yeah. Um, approximate approximate cause for well, underlying envy and jealousy um, qualities of, of our heart and, and the experience of envy and jealousy and discontent is a kind of shame. And it's a kind of shame that comes when we're disconnected from our, our goodness. 
and and so um, then we seek goodness. We seek, we seek the good, goodness externally, as we see it in others. And and there's just this energy of wanting to to steal their goodness because we're disconnected from our own. And likewise, someone who's not connected to their their goodness or their worthiness or their esteem, they might see or project, real or unreal, they, the goodness that they're missing onto us and, and try to, to steal our goodness or our worthiness. And, and therefore, it's expressed in their our jealousy of us. Okay, thank you. Right, so from that disconnection uh, of, of not feeling worthy, we feel shame instead. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Is my picture okay now, Jesse? Your picture is fine. It's, you're definitely breaking up a little more. I mean, when I look at your thing, I can see that your, your signal is still weak. So I might turn your video off again, just in the meantime and just, you know, have it okay. be audio just to keep it so yeah. stronger. Okay. No other questions. Uh, seven factors of awakening, uh, hindrances, the Brahma Viharas, reflecting on the death and everybody you know. Got it all. It's all square. <laughs> That's great. Hmm. Just a, a reminder that in both sets I presented today of a dark and bright set of hindrances and awakening factors, as well as the near far enemies and on the unconditional nature of the Brahma Vihara itself. They're not linear. Though we normally at, in a retreat or meditation start with one. Um, as I said, in the, in the case of the Brahma Viharas, if we practice one, they all come up and, and there's no real particular order we need to follow. So if you have a strong feeling for one, I, I'd carry it with you all the time and try to, uh, try to have a a word or a phrase or in intention toward that Brahma Vihara or in a pair even like the Metta Karuna or Mudita can be interesting. And with the, the uh, awakening factors, the jewel or gems of the Bojanga, it's well, it seems like we lost you again, Steve. Um see if your signal comes back and maybe we'll pick on Sun who has her hand raised over here. Hold on. Oops. You disappeared somehow. 
It's Sun, are you there? Did you both disappear? Oh no, there you are. Hold on. Yeah. So um, I have to like um, for you, Jesse. I like to hear again about the Day of the Dead. Mm -hmm. To come to the Honolulu once and did a retreat on the Day of the Dead. It's really um, moving. Mm. Yeah, that was. Mm -hmm. In the old days when we could travel. <laughs> yeah, we did that for a few years. We had a little retreat in Honolulu with the Sangha there for the Day of the Dead. And I mean, some parts of it we took from, from some traditional practices. You know, my father's family is from Ecuador where they celebrate it not, not maybe as kind of dynamically as in Mexico, you know, but it's still a place where, you know, people would go to the cemeteries and bring meals and um, have that period of kind of reflection, you know, around um, around those who are gone. And I think, yeah, I just feel like there's something so powerful about this time of year, picking some time of year, you know, I mean, I know that other different traditions have it at different times of the year, periods where you honor your ancestors, you know, and you remember them and reflect upon, you know, their good qualities and sometimes maybe difficult things and try to, you know, make offerings and uh, send them well wishes and do our spiritual work that we still have to do in terms of our families and our lineages in terms of, you know, where there might be still, you know, some of these same complexities of heart that Steve's been talking about not maybe totally pure <laughs> joy and pure loving kindness or pure compassion, but you know, where it's a little complicated. And then, and then that honoring of the truth of that and just how important that is culturally to, <clears throat> to have practices that really are sober, you know, at the same time around the inevitability of death and um, have that soberness, but also the the lightness that can come with that too, that can also be playful and kind of, um, that maybe is sometimes necessary in order to be able to feel some of that. Because I do think, you know, like we do have in this tradition, a lot of different practices that are, some of them are much more sort of morbid or culturally distant maybe from where the sort of majority of, of folks who come on this call might be. And, and we want to be careful not to like, in you know, invite a lot of sort of like brooding and heaviness into our practice, um, but to acknowledge, you know, that there are values to that. There's value in the in the contemplations of death and the contemplations of the corpse meditations, you know, and and that there is real wisdom that comes from those things. So I think that I like to take advantage of this time of year for sure, you know, to to do that and. You know, it's a good time of year to make a little altar in your home and bring out either pictures of people who are deceased or um, things that remind you of them and flowers and beauty and, you know, music and whatever it might be to kind of honor that I think is very important and to, to acknowledge our role, our, our sort of place in the, in the wheel of things, you know, that there was an image I was reading in the Vasudhi Maga about, you know, just as the wheel is turning, there's only one point ever that's actually touching the ground. And that that's the point we're living in right now. And then it's like the wheel, the wheel keeps going, the wheel keeps going, but how do we sort of honor that, the, our role and our responsibilities of, of all that we've inherited and all that we're leaving to the future um, in the way we respond to this present moment. So yeah, I think it's a really beautiful kind of range of practices and and ways that I think can be integrated very meaningfully into our, our, the, our Buddhist tradition for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so my second question is for Steve about like, is there a difference, what is the difference of Upika in the seven factors of enlightenment and in the Brahma Viharas? Is there any difference? Let's see, is Steve still here? Michelle, he's here saying he's on your third page. Oh, there you are, Steve. Oh, you're, you're muted there. 
I didn't quite hear Sun's question. Uh, the difference between about the, the Upeka the Brahma, and, about the seven factors. Upeka and the seven factors, and Upeka and the Brahma Viharas. Very briefly, Vipassana Upeka is the ability to be in the midst of all formations, all sankharas, undisturbed by those formations that are, are each of which are arising and passing, arising and passing that is allowing oneself to be completely open and vulnerable to essentially what can feel at times like the constant influx or even assailment through all the six senses and be unperturbed. The Brahma Vihara, the Upeka, on the other hand, is using fixed attention on the emotion, the Upeka emotion or quality, the most sub perhaps the most sublime and subtle of all emotions, the queen or the king of all spiritual emotions, and understand. Understand that we are all subject to meeting our joys and sorrows according to nature, not according to our wishes. So that's, that's seeing and having a, a balanced relationship with ourselves, our own bodies, with all other beings and all other bodies, and with our property, uh, to, uh, to have something skillfully and to use it skillfully in terms of friendships and uh, our homes uh, and you know the, the assets of the planet, proper relationship. So the Brahma Viharas are all relational and the practice, the Upeka practice is to connect with the balance in the midst of all those relational activities, relation to people and places and property. That makes sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Great. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, Kristen, are you there? Go, can you, oops. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. I was wondering if uh, any of you have some suggestions about how to work with the Brahma Viharas in relation to the public figures who are causing harm. Some, some version of this. I would this. put them in a group. When it's difficult people, I put them in a group, any kind of group be a group of all the difficult people in the world, all the difficult animals in the world, all the difficult things in the world, just a group so that you can hardly find them. <laughs> and just blank it out like, you know, rain has no discrimination. It just rains over everything. Well, sometimes, sometimes it seems like your neighbor's garden is getting watered but not your own. <laughs> I, I understand the dilemma. Um, Upandita would often say, if I'm having trouble with a difficult person, don't do it. And then at another time, he gives that an example of, of doing difficult people in a group. Otherwise, we're liable to just have judgments, just have our thoughts about it, what makes them difficult, and so on and so forth. The practice is for us. The practice is to benefit our own heart, to open and make our own heart strong. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we really do. I mean, I think largely because of Stephen Michelle's training with Upandita, really understand the skillfulness of starting with and continuing with and mostly practicing with easier uh, objects, you know, and, and in terms of our loving kindness, in terms of our compassion, that, <clears throat> that it's, through, it's through the confidence that builds with being able to find our path to loving kindness, to these beautiful qualities with easier beings, that 
that that naturally extends over time and that to to feel like we should or kind of insistent on you know getting ourselves into the deep end of the pool and going straight for the hardest places it ends up being uh, it can sort of undermine your own practice and really sort of sabotage the the method so there's a a general sense of like don't worry about it you know like don't force it on yourself and you know along with what steve's doing it's like well here there are ways of of doing it that that you can sort of try i think another Another way that I've actually been practicing recently is like um, bringing it up in a relationship to other fearful beings that aren't human. So like this sense of like, it might be very difficult to send metta to any human being who you can relate to in terms of this sort of mentality and you hold them responsible for their actions and their judgments and their minds and responsibility in a certain way versus like for myself, I'll say a shark. Like, there's a way that they might trigger a very similar sort of like part of my brain uh, in terms of fear, in terms of uh, negativity, but but I have the ability to actually practice um, loving kindness for a shark, right? Or um, a, a growling dog at my neighbor's house that I'm that I know I don't like or that doesn't like me, or or something that has maybe a little sort of different level of consciousness that is still unpleasant or still feels aggressive or still feels that there might actually be a different way to find a relationship into something like loving kindness or compassion or understanding or you know this equanimity um, with a being that is non-human um, but still might kind of evoke some of these same fearful or angry or aversive sort of types of responses. Um, so I think that's a, a worthwhile uh, exploration for sure, you know, um, you know, finding, finding some other kind of being in your life that might be a similar type of negative force, um, but that you can explore with a little. Michelle, were you saying something there? Kind of terrorizing predator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and one of, the, I mean, one of these death meditations, you know, if you look at the Vasudhi Maga, you know, the, the one of the classic first ways of recollecting death is the recollection of, of seeing death as the murderer, as the uh, assailant. Uh, the, and so there's this, you know, again, it's like, we're not, we're not teaching these all the time. We're not saying like, you should spend your retreats doing this or whatever, but like, you get that there's a range of ways in which it's like, how are we cultivating, bringing to mind that which is fearful, that which is evocative of a lot of negative, potentially negative emotions and finding our way into balance with it, finding our way into peace with it, finding our way into the sort of stability of these beautiful qualities. And it's hard. I mean, it's practice. I think that's the other piece that was always worth just taking into consideration that it's, it's often not going to be immediate. There's going to be a, um, a process that we go through around things that are harder, but that still can be worth it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there. Hey, Kathy. Hi. Okay, so um, one of the things that I've been pondering you know, being somebody who has been extremely passionate is that, you know, because Steve talks about the near and far enemies, especially of indifference, you know, and, you know, getting to equanimity and since someone talked about politics, but is how important is it in this time because, you know, to really look at whether it's indifference or getting to equanimity. Because I find myself, you know, happily moving from being passionate, you know, and catching myself, you know, from that hatred and anger, you know, and being in the moment. And then some, you know, because I do a lot of metta and it helps a great deal. And then finding myself being, not that I like the way things are going, or and I'm different to it in that grander scale because you know I recognize the ups and downs and then what people are doing individually, what I'm doing individually, what my friends are doing individually, what younger people are doing individually, that gives me hope, you know, even in the midst of you know the darkness, as it were, that I reach out to. That's a pragmatic part of me. But you know, that emotional part of me that I'm always looking at is, am I avoiding because that's my natural tendency, you know, or 
you know, it's, it's so hard to know about the indifference versus the equanimity. And you know, I tend to kind of really look. And does it really matter that much or is it better just not to be in, I want, I want it to be different or I'm not hating. Does, does, do you understand my question? Yeah, of course. Well, what do you notice when you, when you, when you look? You know, sometimes it feels peaceful, which feels, of course, pleasant, and I don't try to hang on to it. And then sometimes I'm questioning because that's my thing, right? I mean, I do notice if I'm judgmental, you know, and then that's a different thing. But when I'm just looking at a situation, I wonder how much of it is being non-judgmental versus I'm just exhausted and I'm turning into somebody who, let's say in the 30s, became an indifferent person and just let the chaos overwhelm him or her and didn't do enough. Because I used to always wonder, how did people live in those times and let things happen the way they did? And then I have some understanding of that, you know, mm -hmm. of how it was that such horrible things could happen in those times. You know, how it is that people could think a certain way, allow things to happen, you know, and that we're in these times too. So. Yeah. Steve, do you, just because we can't see you, do you want to, do you have anything to start with, Steve? Yes. Okay. Wisdom, wisdom knows the difference, Kathy. And, and wisdom makes a huge difference. Without it, we don't really know what we're doing. And uh, we're just sort of bumbling around uh, from our conditioning, from our desires and fears. You know, w wisdom knows our, our shadow and bright side <clears throat> and, it, and it acts accordingly. When we have equanimity, wisdom knows this equanimity. If we don't know, then it's more likely to be some degree of disconnect, disengagement, um, indifference. Because and if we call up, if we call up our awareness, then we, we can see, we can see the the um, compactness of indifference that it's not connected to things. And, and there's an absence of care close behind compassion that's usually close at hand with wisdom. Because when I don't feel that anger, that hatred, that frustration, that disgust, and you know, it could, you know, I get shocked at myself that it's like a, a sense of understanding, not that I like the actions of people, but you know, it's a sense of, okay, but you know, that's irrespective of that, that's separate. You know, we can't do anything about that. You know, that person is not gonna change or something. I don't mm -hmm. know how to, but it's, it's separate. It, I don't know how to explain that. Well, but it, I think you're saying that you, you have some sense of it. Like you, you get that it feels different that's a little, you know, like, it's like how amazing that we confuse, like you're saying, anger with, we think that because we're angry, that means we care, which is like, if you think about how perverse that is actually in terms of emotionally, like anger and care are like actually totally not the same thing at all. But like, we, we assume that that means we care because we're angry versus like, if we're not angry, there can be this thing of like, oh, maybe that means I don't care, which is like also like a bizarre misinterpretation but you're you're getting you're you're in a cool place where you're trusting that you're like oh actually i get that i'm not angry but i do care and that that is like a paradox that it's it's a it's a different thing to trust in the heart you know that that you are that you are trusting and that it's 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 bearing fruit and and that you might be angry also because you care you know like it's not to say that anger is wrong right it's like but to really get like oh these are all like the, the whole palette is there to be sort of understood in in all these different dimensions and all these different aspects and i think that and to be 
also it's like we can't just judge any external action we can't judge the inner reality of any external action you know something that might look very active on the outside and be motivated by very different things people things might look very passive from the outside but be motivated by very different things and that that means something like that it's not just the action that it's the emotional quality that's motivating an action or a non-action are also important and that those are there's never a there's never like a solid um it's like that thing of like there are no the the truth is never abstract it's always concrete don't worry about absolute truth of like oh is d does indifference and uh equanimity are they the same are they different where are they? it's like forget about the the abstract truth in this moment what's the concrete experience that you have and and where is their caring where is their peace where is their anger where is their aversion and that you're doing it that 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 more important than anything we can say is that you get that it's like you're into investigating you're into understanding and that that's what's going to bear fruit it's just like that constant gentle but dedicated uh, persistence of inquiry and and trying to understand what's happening in the heart and what are the impacts you know what are the places where we're just so exhausted by being angry or upset or worried and so we have a sort of like oh giving up that's temporary but that the mind might need that space for a couple hours and veg out and watch tv or whatever right or there might be a time where anyway that they can all have all these different flavors and that the, the the point of vipassana again is not like about just sort of like constantly ass asserting these abstract truths but like finding our way to like in this experience in this context where is love where is acceptance where is upeka you know where is indifference and and what is really happening and like as steve started his talk with that with sariputta's encouragement of of honest self-assessment honest self-reflection you know and it's it's great it's so important in the times we're living in but to be very careful of not laying on a judgment based on an idea of like, oh, this is what pure love should be. And so that's, and my my experience isn't fitting into that. And so therefore it's not love or whatever, you know? Dynamic. Okay, got it. <laughs> awesome, really yeah. great. Mm. And then I wanna just say, you know, Harry and I are very grateful for all the support that the Sangha has given us. So thank you so very much, all of you. Wonderful, yeah, we're really, Happy to hear. Harry mentioned he had COVID a couple of weeks ago. I mean, he's out of the hospital now, and so he's he's with us again. He's been with us every week through it anyway, uh, in the hospital and out. But it's it's great. We're really relieved and happy. Mm. All right, folks. Maybe that's a good place to end for this week. But um, yeah, you know, take care of your hearts for sure. I don't know, Steve. Do you have any parting words you want to offer? Oh, we're not sure if he's there. Keep your he's practice silent. of of love and wisdom every day. Keep it up. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's your best medicine. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks very Vermonty, Amy Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. Good luck this week, everybody. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>